welcome to the Global Beehive uh, expert interview. And today we have the pleasure to have Mark Leonard with us today. He is the director of Mindfulness Connected and a uh, uh, renowned researcher in the terms of uh, looking at uh, uh, mindfulness and it's important for um, social from the social perspective um, Mark please introduce yourself and welcome to have you on board well hello Hans uh, thank you for inviting me to join you today um, there's uh, I've got to think where to start this is a long journey coming to a point which is looking for ways to address the most difficult problems that we face collectively uh, in society and how to run ourselves, how to organize ourselves and how to uh, therefore organize um, businesses and how we go about doing things in a way that brings about the kind of results that we need to see uh, to, to address the challenges we're facing today. So that's my overall objective coming from um, an interest and previous sort of main interest in my career in environmental sustainability coming to the conclusion that the normal approaches of awareness raising policy regulation um, political um, uh, work to drive impetus in 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 policy and regulation we're really not making the kind of um, steps that we needed to take to create a sustainable future. Uh, it became increasingly obvious to me that there was a systemic issue here. It wasn't just about how we went about solving problems. It was about how we saw ourselves, how we relate to ourselves, how we see the environment, how we see society, how we see all of the functions of what we are as an individual. Um, and that essentially, um, problems of social justice, social inequality, uh, overconsumption of natural resources, the way we use natural resources, the way we reward individuals for what they do, and mental health problems were all systemically related. Um, and so things looked pretty bleak to me, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years ago. And I really came to the conclusion there was only there was a slim chance that there could be some impact by finding some way of applying what I had come to encounter uh, as Buddhist wisdom in a secular format. Um, I'd always been working with my um, background in biological sciences, uh, evolutionary psychology, ecology, and how to manage uh, natural resources, which in the end becomes a social challenge rather than um, something we do to um, the environment. Um, so I was always looking at what I understood as Buddhist wisdom from that, from that angle to try and understand how it really functioned in a sort of biological living world that we could understand from contemporary, you know, modern understandings of how biological systems work. So I could see that there was a way of translating what I'd understood in Buddhist wisdom into that kind of language. And that's where my journey started, really. Looking to find ways of my journey into applying mindfulness as, a, as, as something that could, we could bring into this process of developing systemic change in society, where that, where that journey started. Mm -hmm. So through the early 2000s, I looked for different ways of possibly trying to find ways of doing this. I ended up working in support of fundraising for Oxford, for the Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies, uh, under the direction of uh, Professor Richard Gombrich, uh, the famous, um, yeah, one of the founding fathers of modern sort of applied um, uh, Buddhist studies. And then out of that relationship with the uh, the, 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 his main, the main person working with him to develop the business side of them, <coughs> being, uh, Jeff Bamford. We built a relationship with Professor Mark Williams, at the, who was then uh, on his second trial after the famous trial that brought mindfulness-based cognitive therapy into public awareness. He'd moved to Oxford and was running a second trial 
looking at mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and comparing it with um, uh, a psychoeducation process to see what the actual impact of the meditation element was. Anyway, he was looking, well, Professor Mark Williams was looking to set up a master's degree program and um, a discussion emerged and Jeff Bamford brokered an arrangement with the National Health uh, Trust, the Department of Psychiatry and the owners of a wonderful building of the charity SANE run by uh, Marjorie Wallace to take over the running of this building to provide a home and a center for the Oxford Mindfulness Center. So I moved into supporting the establishment of this institution and out of that um, uh, trained to teach mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and then adapted that in a shortened form based on the book that Mark Williams wrote with Danny Penman, uh, Mindfulness, a Practical Guide to Finding Peace in the Frantic World, which was a very useful, instructive self-help book and used that as a model basis for courses to take into the workplace. Um, I did about 30 programs for uh, a large veterinary surgery provider, CVS Vets in the UK, uh, did around 30 programs and developed a teaching methodology that was much more kind of user friendly in the workplace. So it was a learning how to teach a combination of the sort of biological systematic view of um, complex behavior from an evolutionary perspective to veterinary surgeons who loved that stuff anyway, the sort of broader embodied science as well as the short practices and group activities that brought people together um, as part of the learning process mm -hmm. from a cognitive therapy model. And really then um, I got a wonderful opportunity to, to work with um, the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital and the opportunity to build something new that was not just about how do we teach people to practice mindfulness meditation or mindfulness practices to regulate stress and um, improve their performance, make better decisions and respond in ways that uh, are more conducive to a better environment in the workplace socially, to so something that was explicitly about um, teaching mindfulness meditation practice as part of a vehicle to teach people funda basic skills in communicating effectively to create a safe, psychologically safe environment in which uh, effective communication could take place and teams could start to work in a more uh, integrated way. Mm -hmm. And how then groups in the in the you know, different divisions in the hospital could start to understand each other better and break down some of the siloed barriers of bias that take place in any organization between one group and another or between providers and clients, et cetera. So it was, became explicitly something that was about organizational development rather than something that was about how do we improve um, well-being for individuals. I, it, was a, it, was, it created a model where we recognized that well-being was part of a social group process, every bit as much as it was part of or down to an individual uh, process or practice or self-care strategy. Um, and now... Yeah, so that's that's the big story. Yeah, <laughs> now taking that into an organized, much more structured yeah, organizational yeah. development. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you so framework. much for that introduction and for all the fantastic research you have done and explaining the importance here of mindfulness. Uh, many companies are involved in trying to implement mindfulness, and it's sometimes tricky to understand concretely what mindfulness actually is. Uh, can you, in a few sentences, just describe what is mindfulness? Um, I think I'm going to turn that question on its head a little yeah. bit, if you don't mind. And I think, first of all, let's think about what are we trying to do with it? Mm. 
you know, a tool is always useful in a context for a specific purpose. Mm. Now, um, the context that it's applied in therapy is broadly speaking, the prevention of depression, the reduction or management of stress and anxiety. And so everything that we call mindfulness is then presented in a pedagogical framework, a teaching methodology designed for that outcome. Mm. Now, the outcome that, that has evolved out of therapy is, is, is one that is more to do with performance and personal development mm. in the workplace and, uh, I mean, self-help in wider society as well. But I'm looking for an outcome that is about that is broadly speaking about how does a group of people work together more effectively mm -hmm. to produce a, a more inclusive, uh, diverse, cohesive um, s sort of um, organization that is able to act adaptively in difficult, challenging situations to deal with the kind of problems that are uh, we're facing in society today to become more sustainable, mm -hmm. to become more equitable, to in, to become to 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 bring people together so they are actually working for the same cause, committed to that same cause, and exploiting fundamental human nature that mm -hmm. wants to be part of a group to create something that is good for the group and all of the relationships that individuals have within that group and with their stakeholders so it's a very different objective yeah. so yeah how do, what is mindfulness itself yeah. it's simply a an attentional training protocol mm. that teaches us to refine uh, fine-tune two modes of attention that um um Ian McGrill Christ would, would argue are regulated by the two different sides of the brain, the right side of the brain regulating an, a wide, expansive, receptive, moment-to-moment -moment awareness of changing sensory conditions. Mm -hmm. and, the left, and what's regulated on the left side of the brain is something more linguistic, conceptual, abstract, specific, uh, it objectifies, it looks for models to explain, to enact. So when we have over time overstressed the importance of the analytical and the problem solving aspects of modeling that are very much self-contained in the left side of the brain functioning, we over, we under invest in the expansive open um, non-directive kind of intuitive type of, 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 of attentional processes that take place that are regulated by the right side. So the attentional practice itself teaches both, uh, to fine tune both of these aspects in different aspects of mindfulness practice. There's focus in concentration practice, and then there is relaxing the focus of attention to maintain attention of an open field of awareness. I believe what this does is it regulates, uh, sets, regulates both of these systems and enables these two alternative forms of attention to build a constructive dialogue that begins to enable them to work together in a much more adaptive uh, way. So, that's what mindfulness practice is. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful explanation. I think it was a brilliant. Uh, what we see today is that man, many companies have invested quite a lot in, in um, agile way of working and, and sort of breaking down the silos of the organization. Mm, in some mm. cases, it works very well, but it, it, men are struggling with how to collaborate across borders and mm. organizational units. And I can somehow... Uh, see that this is very much related to finding the right social uh, dimensions of um, of this kind of collaboration. Uh, is this yeah. something you see as well, and something you work with? How to deal with this kind of problem? Um, very much so, um, and 
the 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 thing is to start with we, we can say what we've brief i've briefly sort of tried to describe what mindfulness practice is in mm. terms of a sort of uh, attentional uh, training mm. its outcome in terms of regulating the human cognitive and perceptual mm. decision making process and why we're applying it in uh, an organization as the objective what are we trying to achieve one of those things is necessarily um, a communication effective communication uh, between different silos that have different languages and different cultures and how to understand that that's so but but whenever we say we want to do something or achieve something we first have to recognize that there is a cost benefit in whatever we do mm. it requires an investment in time and that is very hard for us to to uh, um, quantify because it's very hard to quantify the kinds of outcomes that we're looking for and the kind and recognize the kind of time and investment in what is needed to create those if i'm being more specific obviously there's the investment in in uh programs that teach people the nuts and bolts of how to practice what i'm describing as social mindfulness individual mindfulness relational mindfulness and group functions of mindfulness how, how to understand them and practice them so there's an investment in terms of training firstly secondly there's an investment in what you learn i.e people have to start taking using the tools themselves to regulate their own cognitive process their own thinking their decision making and their emotional states their stress states so that's an investment in itself maybe a few minutes a day intermittent through the day short periods of meditation or going for a walk or whatever it might be switching your computer off but remembering those routines building them into the whole working day and secondly there are how should i put it there are, there are there are protocols that you need to apply whenever you actually engage in a communication process now we can start with very simple practices of learning the language of describing our experience, asking another person or, and listening to another person describe their experience and learning a skill of not trying to interrupt them to solve the problem or give them advice, but simply apply the skill of open awareness in the presence of another as they describe this and keep on noticing the way we're trying to analyze, but, but, but uh, maintaining attention of the open awareness, which is basically, basically awareness of our emotional, changing emotional states in the body before, and then sharing that process to create psychological safety, understanding, a shared understanding of being together emotionally and socially before we actually start looking at the details of uh, a, a problem that we need to solve i mean this works just simply in an inter formal in informal interaction that's happening all the time in the day with people at the photocopier and stuff we have to do this more and more consciously as we're working mm -hmm. virtually um, so investing in that sort of five six minutes before we start to talk business mm -hmm. recognize that's important to get the psychological safety a shared understanding before we start to actually talk about what we mean what we want to do how we want to do it um, that that process can be extended into groups when they're also looking for you know the kind of blue sky thinking uh, explorative thinking that starts to take place in a larger group that's experimenting in a design context what should we do throwing different ideas it's all got to be based on the psychological safety where nobody's afraid of getting anything wrong it's not about getting anything right it's actually just more about playing around with ideas playing around with words playing around behaviors in the knowledge that there's something collectively going on that can throw up trigger different thoughts different interactions different 
connections between different people that comes up with novel adaptive approaches that then can be analyzed and strategically structured mm -hmm. following that process uh, yeah but that's, that's really really interesting that you are mentioning these these different aspects of it and uh, the openness uh, to new ideas because i think that many business people are very too stressed or are yeah. have experience uh, a feeling of infobesity uh, that are having a negative impact on this openness and not yes. to see the, the cognitive part of, of their, their job somehow. Yes. If you would give some advice to uh, executives uh, that are maybe generally fostered in a command and control uh, environments mm. uh, and, and how to get more out of their teams using mindfulness, what, what would you say to them? What would be these three advice to get started and, and to, to get some, some concrete actions going? The normal way of advising anybody that is interested in bringing mindfulness practice into uh, a working environment or a community is to start to establish a personal understanding yourself. Mm. So you start to learn how, learn its value, you start to experience it. Um, you can read certain, you know, you can read the theoretical arguments, but very rarely do people buy into this stuff until they've tasted it mm. personally. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe attitudes are shifting because it's becoming so much more, pe more and more people are talking about it and more and more people are willing to kind of look at this as some kind of uh, novel approach and experiment with that. So perhaps there are two different ways, but out uh, when but, but 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 when an individual or a leader or a decision maker has come to the conclusion this is worth investing in obviously part of that is developing their own understanding of what it is and what it can achieve and then persuading others to come on board with that um is to understand how much of a challenge this is even though it appears to be incredibly simple mm. to do something like regularly spend before a meeting, switch, you know, um, spend a minute paying attention to the breath, regulating the emotional state, disengaging <laughs> from, you know, the problem solving, strategic thinking, and um, ground yourself in, 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 in an open awareness state. Mm. Um, learning to do that is one step. Now, there's a, it's a huge next step to start to learn how to, or become skillful at bringing that into an explicit part of um, uh, a, a workplace behaviors. There's a whole lot of work that goes into the, you know, it wouldn't have taken so, it wouldn't have taken us effectively, let's say we went back to, um, John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness-based stress reduction as a marker point. We could go back further. We could go back to, you know, uh, early 20th century Buddhism in Burma and how new ideas in meditation practice migrated to the West. Eventually, it became a standardized protocol that John Kabat-Zinn put together. Mm. Um, and that that was, you know, that he did that. His his, his sort of key book was published in in. Uh, I think, was it 79 or 80? I mean, maybe it was 89. Anyway, we're going back 40 years, 30 or 40 years, and we're still just beginning to experiment with how do we take this into a social process rather than apply it as an individual solution. So the teaching methods are still evolving. We're at the cutting edge. I mean, I think you know, I'd claim I'm at the cutting edge of finding teaching methods or developing teaching methods through teaching, maybe, you know, getting on for a hundred programs and mm -hmm. many, many dozens of introductory sessions and, and practicing leading groups with us, with, with, with a sort of, with, a, with those, those understandings behind them rather than as a therapist or a or a Buddhist teacher, but more as a facilitator in a contemporary social context that 
that echoes what we're trying to achieve in the culture of a community. So, so there's a long journey from getting to the point of getting it. You know, mm -hmm. there's a point where people need to get it, and then there's a long journey and a, of, of, of bringing in skills which. Um, I've been working at developing protocols, understanding practices, collaborations to get to a point where this actually is going to have an impact uh, effectively in, in a group. You know, you, you can't risk it. You can come in with an experiment, but you've got to be pretty sure that it's, you're, you, you, it's persuasive, uh, people buy into it, there's a good attitude, and it has an impact and people will appreciate that. And that takes a long time to establish any new sense. approach in, in, in society broadly, you know, in any way, and particularly in a business environment. Yeah, I, don't know, I don't know, uh, uh, Mark, if you're familiar with um, uh, this book from David Geller's uh, Mindful Work. He's a I, journalist. Yeah, he's a journalist from the uh, New York Times. Yeah. Right? In his book, he uh, reveals what business leaders around the country, that's what it says here, are already discovering that meditation may be the key to fostering a happier, more productive workplace. Yeah. 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 So in that book, yeah. he explores in depth the, the benefits of mindfulness in business and also comes up with evidence, real work, ex uh, world examples of uh, yeah. support the notion that mindfulness, more often than not, right, um, has mm. a direct positive impact in, uh, yeah. on the bottom line uh, of, uh, of a business. So what, what would you say, what would you say to uh, management? Because management is always thinking about bottom line. How is this yep. going to affect my bottom line? Is it going to make it better? Is it going to improve it? Yeah. Okay. The, the simple answer is, what are the results of carrying on business as usual? In the UK, we have one in four people in any one year present with a diagnosable mental health problem. We have, an, we have a crisis of organization in business, a crisis in terms of engagement, and a, sustain, a sustainability crisis. There's a point where people have to go, I can't carry on doing things in the, with business as usual. Where do we go? Now, this is where we go, and we, the, the, the challenge is creating a model that I've talked about, mm -hmm. a teaching model, an explanation model that describes, that enables people to see that there is a path to follow to get to a result which is sustainable organizations, sustainable society. And that means inclusion, diversity, co cooperation, cohesion uh, working together for collective good fantastic thank you thank you so much mark um i i very much enjoyed this talk with you and you have shed so much light on on uh, mindfulness but also about um social in you now collective intelligence and, and social the social dimension of organization itself and how to improve performance of the team uh, using mindfulness rather than to to uh, suboptimize one person or one leader and such um, i would very much like to have another interview with you later on where we can go into depth into certain areas uh, but I, I definitely want to thank you so much for participating in this um, Global Beehive talk. And uh, thank you so much for being an expert on our panel. Thank you. And a pleasure to meet you, Hans and Mario again. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, see you more on uh, Global Beehive and, uh, and uh, in other places. Thank you. Thank you.